question I have for us this morning, and it's a very important question at the beginning of this year. The question is, what is worship? What is worship? Is worship singing and only singing? Is it perhaps singing with enthusiasm, raising your hands, closing your eyes? That's worship. Is worship a feeling, a feeling that you get when you're singing a specific song perhaps? Is, is worship just understanding something in the Bible with no feeling at all? What is worship? Now, if we look at the Bible, we see worship from beginning to end. In Genesis 4, we see Cain and Abel offering a uh, sacrifice as an act of worship right in the beginning of the Bible. And right at the end in Revelation 21, uh, uh, we see the kings of the earth bring their glory into the new Jerusalem and in such a way worshiping God. So even though the Bible is full of worship, we still have to answer the question, what is it exactly? What is worship? And that's what we're going to attempt to do this morning. And so we're going to survey the biblical teaching on worship, and we're going to organize our thoughts on three headings. The first heading is what worship is. The second heading is what worship isn't. And the third, third heading is what worship must do. So it's what worship is what worship isn't, and what worship must do. And we'll start at our first point, what worship is. And this is going to be a survey of what the Bible says about it, a brief one at that. It'll take many hours to do the full survey. But allow me a bit of latitude here just to explain what we find in the, in the Old and New Testament. So when we survey the words that the Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers use for worship, we see a consistent theme, a unifying theme about all these words emerging out of these words. And I'm going to give you this theme and then I'm going to show you how it plays out. So when we look at all the words used for worship in the Bible, we see that worship is giving something in response to God. It is this is the smallest, the smallest definition I can give. Is worship is giving something in response to God. Giving something in response to God. That is worship. Now, it can be in response to who God is. It can be in response to what God has done. It can be in response to what God is saying or what God has said. But it is in response to God. The response can be an outward action, it can be an inner heart conviction, it, but it involves all that you are as a person. It involves your mind, it involves your, your body, it involves your heart, your feelings, your emotions. It involves them all. But it is always, and first, a response. And it always involves giving something. It always involves giving something. So now that we've just thought about this a little bit, let's look at the words, some of the words, the most important ones themselves. So the most common word in the Old Testament for worship means this. It means to bow down low, to bow down deeply. It is to bow down, in other words, to revere someone, to show respect, to display the worth or influence of another over you. You see this in Genesis 4.26, Abraham's slave going to look for a wife for Isaac. He prays to the Lord and the Lord answers his prayer as he's finishing it. And then what does he do in response? He bows down low to the ground, praising, worshiping God. We see this in Exodus 4 verse 31 where Moses comes to the Israelites who are under the yoke of slavery under Pharaoh. And their life is absolutely miserable and Moses comes with the word from God that I have seen your affliction and I'm going to rescue you as my people. And how do the people respond? They bow down low in worship that God has seen their plight and God has responded to it by bringing someone to take them out of this land of slavery. 
It's a bowing down low. One theological dictionary puts it like this. It says the verb always refers to an action or attitude directed toward a human or divine figure who is recognized as being in a position of honor or authority. It always is an action to someone who you recognize this person is an authority over me. This person is worthy of honor. Now in Hebrew, the richness of, uh, of the word is in the picture of the word, the picture it conveys. And the picture here is of someone bowing very low to the ground before someone else. And this outward picture of bowing, if I were to bow down before you right now, I'd be symbolizing something, wouldn't I? I'd be symbolizing that in my heart, I truly believe that you are more worthy more honorable, more powerful, more praiseworthy than I am. That's what bowing symbolizes, right? It symbolizes that the person you're bowing to is more worthy, more honorable, more powerful, more praiseworthy than yourself. And this bowing then is, uh, is actually, it's, it's giving the person you're bowing to something. It's giving them something, isn't it? It's giving them respect. It's giving them honor. It's giving them even submission. It's saying, you are worthy. I am not worthy. I bow down before you. You are the one that deserves the respect, the honor. That's what bowing down is, right? That's the picture of it. That's what it conveys. Now, with this word bowing down, you often find other words connected with it closely in Scripture, especially when God speaks to the Israelites and He says, listen, you must worship me and you must not worship all these other pagan gods of these other people. He puts a word with this bowing that shows that its bowing isn't all that it is. It's connected to something else. And I'm just going to survey a few verses and so you can get the idea. In Exodus 20 verse 5, he says, God tells his people, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So don't worship or serve. Or means it's the same thing. If you're going to serve, it's like you're worshiping. In Exodus 23, verse 24, you shall not worship their gods, nor serve them. See, same thing, worship, serve, put together. Deuteronomy 30, verse 17. Uh, but if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. And then Joshua 23, verse 7, it says, um, uh, you must not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down. That is the word for worship, bow down to them. So Joshua says, don't bow down, don't serve. Instead of doing all these things for other gods, the Israelites are to do something else. They must worship the true God. Deuteronomy 10 verse 20 says, you shall fear, that's a word for worship, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. You see the connection there between worship and service. Outward service is a reflection of an inner belief. Just like bowing is a reflection of an inner belief, isn't it? When you bow down before someone, you believe that person is superior. When you serve someone, you believe that person deserves to be served. He's worthy of your service, right? And so it is as we approach God, service and, and worship or bowing down, they go together. You will always serve the God you worship. You will worship the God you serve. Worship and service go together. Now we come to the New Testament. What is interesting about the New Testament is that the key word for worship in the New Testament is in fact the translation of that Hebrew word that means to bow down. It's just a translation of that word. But it adds more precision. The New Testament adds more precision to, the, to this idea. It, and the precision it adds is that it narrows who can be worshipped. In Hebrew, the beauty is in the picture of the word. In Greek, the beauty is in the precision of the word. And in the New Testament, we see that this, this word for worship is used in context where it always limits who you can worship. And the whole point of the New Testament, in every, every time this word is used, the context always makes clear that only God can be worshipped. 
And only Jesus Christ himself can be worshipped. No one else can be worshipped. Every time people try and worship other people or angels, you hear a correction coming from the New Testament writers. In Acts 10 verse 25 to 26, Peter is, um, has a vision and he's uh, called to go uh, to this Gentile man, Cornelius, to go and share the gospel with him and his family. And so um, the, the angel appears to Cornelius and tells him, a man's going to come and he's going to share the word with you. And so when Cornelius sees Peter, he bows down. Verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. That word. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I too am just a man. In other words, don't worship me. Don't worship another person. I'm just a man. Where must worship go? It must be directed towards God. In Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9, we see John uh, at the end of receiving all these wonderful and terrifying visions of the future by this, this, this angel. This is how he responds in Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship. There's the word, at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow slave with you, your brothers and the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. That's what the angel tells him. Worship God. You can only worship God. And then one of the most interesting things about this word is when it is used of Jesus, it is used to make sure that we understand how great Jesus is. When it's used of Jesus, the context always shows that Jesus is fully worthy of your worship. In Matthew 2, the thought is that Jesus is king, and that's why he must be worshipped. Matthew 2, verse 1 to 2 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea and the days of, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. He is the king, and they've come to worship him. So Jesus is king, and that's why he must be worshipped. In Matthew 8, verse 2, the thought is that Jesus is Lord, and that's why he must be knelt before or worshipped. Remember that word, bowing down. Right away, a man with a serious skin disease or a leper came up and knelt before. That's the word for worship. Knelt before him, knelt before Jesus, saying, Lord, if you are willing you can make me clean, recognizing the lordship of Jesus. In Matthew 14, verse 33, after the disciples see Jesus walking on water and calming the storm, the thought there is that Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God, and that's why he must be worshipped. So verse 33 says, Then those in the boat worshipped him, that is Jesus, and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is amazing what we see in the New Testament. We see people worshipping Jesus. And in light of what God has said about himself in Isaiah 42 verse 8, which says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. When we think of that verse, then these passages in the New Testament become a, a very strong case for the deity of Jesus. In other words, that Jesus is God. If God says, I will not give my glory to any other, and yet he allows people to worship Jesus, what does that mean about Jesus? He is God. He is God. Because he receives worship as the King, as the Lord, as the Son of God. Well, there's one other important word. Well, there are many other words, but there's one important word for worship in the New Testament. And when we think of the Old Testament, what do you think that word means? It means to serve or to minister. In the same way that that other word connected to worship was used in the Old Testament. So let's pull it all together. Worship is giving something in response to God. Worship starts with recognizing who God is, what God does, and what He has said. And when we recognize who God is and how great He is, and how superior he is to us in every conceivable way, then worship responds by giving God the honor, adoration, praise, service, submission, obedience, sacrifices, offerings, all that he deserves. That's what worship is. It's giving. If you think of worship 
and you think of receiving, you've got the equation the wrong way around. Worship is about giving. When you think about worship, this is one thing I want you to remember today. You must think, what am I giving? If I'm worshiping, I'm giving something. I'm giving attention. I'm giving, I'm giving honor. I'm giving service. I'm giving adoration to God. I'm giving of my best, and I'm giving. Worship is giving. And I think that's very important, especially in our time today, to think about that. Now let's go through what worship isn't. And I'm just going to go through four kinds of unacceptable worship. And they from John MacArthur's excellent book, Worship, The Ultimate Priority. I recommend the book. I'm just going to highlight some of the points he makes there. And, uh, and I think they're very helpful for us, just to be clear what worship isn't. So worship, the first form of false worship is worship of idols. The worship of idols is not true worship. That should be obvious, right? Obvious that the worship of anything but the true God of the Bible is not actually true worship at all. If you're worshiping anything but the true God of the Bible, you're not worshiping. And that's from Isaiah 42 verse 8, which we read earlier. But you know what the sad reality is? Most people in the world worship false gods. Most people in the world. That's what Scripture says itself. Romans 1 verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Notice how this is a worship issue. They know God, but they do not recognize Him as being in a position of honor and authority over them. In other words, in their hearts, people don't believe that God is worthy that he is more worthy than they are, more honorable, more powerful, more praiseworthy than they are. They don't believe that. And that's why it says they do not honor him as God or give thanks. You will not give thanks to someone you don't believe has given you life and everything you have. You won't give thanks to someone who you do not think is worthy of your thanks. So the problem of the world, the unbelieving world, is, is really a worship issue that then expresses itself in further and further depravity. It starts with verse 21 of Romans 1, talks about this worship problem, where they know God, they don't want to worship Him, so they become futile, and they, they just move on their way down that path. The important thing to recognize here is that the assumption of the Bible everywhere, and you should know yourself, and I know myself, is that we are worshipers by nature. God made us that way. God made us that way. If we do not worship God, we will worship something. We'll worship some idol, something else, or we'll worship ourselves. So when people don't worship God, they worship idols, and God then hands them over to their sin and its consequences. And that's what basically Romans 1 is all about. It talks about people starting with wrong worship, and then wrong worship leads to folly, and then folly leads to exchanging the glory of God for idols. And that exchanging of the glory of God for idols leads to impurity and people dishonoring their bodies with each other. And that leads to enslavement, to wickedness. And then that leads to judgment from God without any excuses. People always worship. MacArthur writes in this book, he says, When people reject God, they invariably worship false gods. That is true even of an atheist. He worships himself. That, of course, is what God forbade in the first commandment, end quote. So you're always worshiping. Even the person who says there's no God, he's worshiping himself. Okay, so some of you are probably thinking, all right, last time I checked, I did not have an idol in my house or garden like my Hindu neighbor whom I love and I want to share the gospel with. Last time I checked, I have, I'm not an atheist, so maybe I'm fine. But you know, hearts can make idols of even good things. You know that, right? Our hearts can make idols of even good things. Sometimes we desire good things like respect from other people and they don't give it to us. And then we respond by sinning. That means that this, I desire this respect so much that I desire it more than I desire to please God and respond in a godly way. I will sin because you're not giving me the respect I believe I deserve. Sometimes we can make an idol of something like a relationship. I desire to have this relationship with this person. This person is tempting me to sin. I am going to sin because I want this relationship more than I want to please and honor God. And of course, the big idol in our day is the idol of material wealth. 
material wealth is a massive idol in our day. It always was an idol throughout the history of the world. Job 31, one of the oldest books of the Bible. It is the oldest book in the Bible. Job 31, verse 24 to 28. He says that if I placed my confidence in gold or called fine gold my trust, if I have rejoiced because my wealth is great or because my own hand has acquired so much, if I've gazed at the sun when it was shining or at the moon in splendor so that my heart was secretly enticed and I threw them a kiss, this would also be a crime deserving punishment, for I would have denied God above. Job is basically saying here that if he worships his wealth or, or anything else in creation, he's denying God. So if, in other words, if anyone centers their life around their possessions and wealth, they are denying God. People can very easily put their confidence in their possessions and their wealth. That's what Job is talking about. And you know, poor people can put their confidence in their wealth as much as rich people. It doesn't, you don't have to be rich to have this idol of the heart. Poor people can put their confidence in wealth just as much as rich people. You can have very little money but love it very much. You can have a lot of money and love it little. It's not about the amount of money or the amount of wealth or the amount of positions. It's about your heart and how your heart responds to it. Does your heart put your trust, put its trust in it or not? It's easy to put our confidence in money instead of God. And so it's something we need to think about as we think about worship. Worship. Are we worshiping God or are we worshiping an idol? The second point is that the worship of the true God is in a wrong form. So the, the, we did the first form of false worship is worship, worshiping a false God. Now it's worshiping the true God in a wrong form. So this is the sin of the golden calf in Israel. Remember in Exodus 32, they make this golden calf. And they, when they make that calf, they actually believe that this calf is a representation of the true God that they believe that brought them out of Egypt. They're not saying we're replacing the God. We're saying they said to each other, no, this is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. We've reduced the infinite God into this golden calf that you can see because it's easier to worship something you see. So why don't you just have this calf and you, when you look at the calf, you can think about God. And so that's worshipping in the wrong way. The right God in the wrong way. It's reducing the infinite majesty of God into an image. And so that is wrong worship. And then there's the third one, is, uh, which is a big one for our day. It's worshipping God in your own way. So making up your own way of worshipping God. Doing things in your own way that you think is right. So um, the Old Testament is full of examples of that. So we have Nadab and Abihu lost their lives because they brought strange fire to the Lord before the Lord in Leviticus 10. And the Lord struck them down immediately because they were doing worship their own way. Saul lost his kingdom for sacrificing before God said he must sacrifice in, first, in Samuel 13. He lost the entire kingdom because he just did not obey the Lord on this one point. Wait until Samuel comes. He didn't do it. He did it his own way. He said, I can do this myself. And then we have Uzo who lost his life for touching the ark in 2 Samuel 6. Trying to help perhaps, but he should have known better. He was part of the tribe who was supposed to carry the holy things. And he knew that the way they carrying this, this ark was not right. It was meant to be carried by Levites. It was meant to be carried by poles inserted through the rings of the ark and carried on the shoulders of men and the way they were carrying it was they put it on a cart and when it stumbled he tried to save save it but God struck him dead the good summary of this idea is done by MacArthur he says all these incidents teach us that God will not accept deviant worship some would insist that any kind of sincere worship is acceptable to God but that is simply not true. The Bible clearly teaches that those who offer self-styled worship are unacceptable to God, regardless of their good intentions. And we would do well to remember that. Good intentions are not what's important in worship ultimately. It's, it's oh, am I worshiping 
the way God said I must worship. Because you can have good intentions and do some things that are really sinful. It's not only about the intentions. Yes, we must have pure intentions when we worship God, obviously. But we must also know what God wants us to do. And then the final form of false worship is what most of us battle with day in and day out, week in and week out, Sunday after Sunday. It is worshiping the true God in the right way, but with a wrong attitude. Worshiping the true God in the right way, but with a wrong attitude. And the one wrong attitude that is helpful for us to think about is the one wrong attitude that is easy for us to adopt is not giving your best. And I want you to turn to Malachi chapter 1 and just spend some time with me there. We won't spend too long on it. Right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 1. Verse 6 through to verse 14. It's a lengthy passage, but I'll read it and you'll get the flow of it. And you'll be helpful I read all of it because we'll put it all in context. Okay, so we have Malachi chapter 1. It's the last book of the Old Testament before Matthew. Verse 6 to 14. This is God speaking to his people. They are worshipping. They are worshipping at the second temple. They are going through the motions of worship. Now God is coming and he's giving them an evaluation of what he thinks of their worship. It says there in verse 6, A son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? Can you see the idea of worship? Worship is about giving honor to God. It's about bowing down, giving honor. If I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. You ask, how have we defiled you? When you say, the Lord's table is contemptible. So he's accusing them of saying these things. And now he's going to prove it. Verse 8. When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? What were they supposed to present? The best, right? Without defect. And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor? Asks the Lord of hosts. He's saying, this worship you're giving me, see if the governor will accept it. If he won't accept it, why are you giving it to me? Verse 9, and now ask for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor? Asks the Lord of hosts. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors. So you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will accept no offering from your hands. For my name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled and it's, product its food is contemptible you also say look what a nuisance and you scorn it says the lord of hosts you bring stolen lame or sick animals you bring this as an offering am i to accept that from your hands ask the lord verse 14 the deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the lord for i am a great king says the lord of hosts and my name will be feared among the nations. Do you get the tone of this? Is God happy about what they're doing? No. What are these people doing? They're perhaps vowing the best and giving the defective animal. They are giving things to God that they know not even their governor would accept. They are saying, this is okay. It's okay for God. It'll, it'll be okay for him. It's not their best, basically. It's just not their best. These people were happy to give God what they knew even their earthly superiors would not accept. And they found their worship to be a chore. Now this kind of attitude is still around, isn't it? Yes, we do not bring lambs and sacrifice things and like that, but this heart attitude, can you see what's going on in the heart of these people? They're willing to give God their second best. 
and they're happy about it. Is this not the same as the person in our day and age who you know, comes to church with just every, expecting everyone just to be happy that he made it to church? This person just kind of rolls out of bed and comes to church. There's no prayer before thinking about what am I going to do. There's no um, desire to come and to give, to serve, to listen, to engage with God and His people. That person is just here. And, and that person really wants us all to be so happy that he made it. Um, just be happy that I made it. I mean, it's hard enough to get here. Some people do approach worship that way. And that's not even giving God second best. It's giving God not the best at all. And then consider how we often approach work as opposed to church. Isn't sometimes not easy for us to, to do things like this? Think about this. Do you get to work on time but come to church late? What does that say? Do you take care to be presentable when you go to work but come to church with any old clothes? Do you go to work expecting to add value and deliver quality work but then come to church expecting to relax and just sit back and maybe have a nap? Do you prepare well for your important meetings at work and you prepare your presentations well and you make sure you got your facts in, the, in line? You're ready for that meeting, but then you waltz into church without even a prayer or personal preparation, or personal reading of the scriptures to prepare you to meet with God and to meet with His people. Are these not things that we can fall into as people? That we can give God our second best and not give God our best? And then we sometimes reason it out and say, well, you know, I need my job. I mean, I need to live, but church is kind of optional. Is that the way God sees it? What does God say is important? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness are the words of Jesus. And all these other things will be added unto you. So we need to consider when we come to worship, are we giving our best? Are we giving our best? The final thing I want to talk about is just hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in worship is talked about in Amos 5, verse 21 to 24, Hosea 6, verse 4 to 6. In fact, if you read the entire Minor Prophets, all 12 of them, you'll see this is a repeated issue. And basically it talks about people coming to church but, or coming to worship God but living a worldly life. In other words, people not interested in what God is interested in but happy to perform the outward form of worship. And uh, this is the kind of person who, who doesn't really want to get to know God, but is happy to come to church once a week and offer God a form of religion on a Sunday. And that's also a form of false worship. So that's what worship is. And final point, what worship must do. And this is where we want to close, what worship must do. Now, I want you just to think again. We're thinking about worship. When we talk about worship, and you talk about this with each other or with friends, I'm always amazed, and you should be amazed too, how often we talk about things like, I think a worship service should be like this. I like the music like that. I prefer preaching like this. I like to express myself in worship like that. I need to feel like this. I want people to treat me like that. You get the idea. When we talk about worship in the church, often we're talking about um, what we prefer, what we like. But you know what the most important thing about worship is in the Bible? The most important thing about worship, especially if we look in the New Testament, we are New Testament believers, the most important thing about worship is whether what you are doing is acceptable to God. That's the word you see coming up again and again. One of the most important adjectives to that New Testament word for worship is acceptable. 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 You see that word repeated over and over again. So the question that we should have when we think about worship is not how much am I enjoying this worship. The question we should have in our minds is 
Does God find this worship acceptable? That's the question. So let's look at just a few examples of acceptable worship from the New Testament. Romans 14, Paul's dealing with Christians and their preferences and different issues of conscience. And he's, he's dealing with people who have very sensitive consciences and people who don't have sensitive consciences. And the things that they're differing on are not moral issues. They are just whether some people feel they can eat meat or must be vegetarian or whether some people who are Jews still feel the Sabbath is important or not. And so he's dealing with those issues, those issues of what we call liberty. And then he talks about it in Romans 14, verse 13 to 18. I'm going to just read the whole passage because the flow will help you understand what he's talking about. Romans 14, verse 13 to 18. Therefore, let us no longer criticize one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in your brother's way. I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it is unclean. For if your brother is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy that one Christ died for by what you eat. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, Whoever serves, that's the word for worship, Christ, whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and approved by men. The one who has freedom and says, look, I never was a Jew. I'm a Gentile. I can eat pork, but because my Jewish brother has an issue about eating pork, I will not eat pork in front of him because I want to walk in love in front of him. I will limit my liberty for the sake of this brother. I will limit what I, what I do for the sake of this sister. The one who does that, the one who does that is worshipping Christ in an acceptable way, in a way that God is happy about. Why? Because that expresses Christ's compassion for His people. Christ gently leads His people from where they are to where they need to be. And so when we gently and not uh, in a way to cause our brothers to stumble. When we work with them and live in an understanding way with them, we then offer worship that is acceptable to Christ and acceptable to God. Romans 15 verse 16, Paul talks about his evangelism. Evangelism is an act of worship. He says, verse 16, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving, in other words, worshiping as a priest of God's good news. My purpose is that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. His hope here is that this evangelism that he's doing, like, and these, these people that God is working in as a result of his evangelism, that that will be acceptable to God. So living in love with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is acceptable. Evangelizing other people is an act of worship that's acceptable. Philippians 4.18 but I have received everything in full. Paul's talking to the Philippians who supported him in his ministry financially. And he's saying, I've received everything in full. I have an abundance. I'm fully supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. There's the word acceptable again. He is giving the church, he's, this is the giving of the church to meet Paul's needs as a minister of the gospel. And Paul is describing it as worship. He's saying this act of giving money to me so I can continue in this ministry is an act of worship. And it is acceptable and it pleases God. This was more than just giving money to anyone who comes in the door. It was a gospel partnership. And that's what he says in chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. He says, I give thanks to my God for, in, for every remembrance of you. Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. These people were worshipping. They were worshipping by saying, Paul is sharing the gospel there. He needs support. Let's help him by giving him support, by giving him financial support. And that was acceptable worship in God's eyes. And then finally we see acceptable worship is caring for other believers and doing good. Hebrews 13 verse 15 to 16, which kind of is a good summary passage. It says there, Therefore, through Him, that's Jesus, let us continually offer up to God 
a sacrifice, that's worship language, offering up to God a sacrifice of praise, that is the fruit of our lips that confess His name. So there we have worship, which is lips that confess His name, speech proclaiming the glory of Christ, glory of God. Verse 16, don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. So for us, as New Testament believers, acceptable worship, we don't go and we don't offer a lamb on, a, on an altar, do we? We don't do that. We don't slaughter animals. Why? Why don't we do that? Because Christ, the perfect Passover lamb, has been slaughtered for the sins of his people so that we can be forgiven. We respond to that by worshiping him, by confessing that he is our Lord and Savior, by praising him for what he has done for us, by doing good, sharing with others. This is the kind of worship that pleases God. All these examples are examples of giving, aren't they? You give love, you give the gospel, you give praise, you give to someone's needs, you share. It's all giving. Worship is giving. I want you just to imagine, to imagine if we all came to church looking to do these things, looking to love, to give, to share the gospel, to praise God, to, to give to the needs, to share with others. Imagine all of us coming to church with that attitude. And you know what? We can. You can. And I can. We can experience this loving, gospel-sharing, God-praising, people-helping worship. We can experience that this side of heaven. It starts with us. It starts with us. It starts with me. It starts with you. Will you come here ready to give next week? Will you come here ready to give honor, adoration, praise, service, submission, and obedience to God? Will you come here ready not to receive, but instead to give? Will you come here seeking to give that honor and adoration to God with your best and without hypocrisy. By God's grace, you can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we could spend thinking about worship. Thank you for reminding us that it is an act of giving and not of receiving. Thank you that we could reflect on the kind of worship that you accept. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Father, help us to have this truth impact our planning, even as we think of coming to church again next week. As we prepare ourselves mentally to gather with your people, I pray that you would help us to consider these truths. That we would think carefully about how we come to church, what we are coming to church for, and what we are coming to church to give. Lord, we know that you are a great king and your name is great among the nations and you are reigning from heaven. So we pray that as we gather as your people, we would gather in light of that truth. We would not come willing to give second best. No, Father, we ask that you'd help us to come with our best. Come in every way possible, ready to hear from you. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.